The scariest thing that ever happened to me was on Halloween night of 1999. I remember it fell on a Saturday that year because I was a 22-year-old bartender at the time and whenever Halloween fell on a weekend like that, you just knew you were in for a crazy night. Back then, I was living in Morgantown, West Virginia, so Halloween was always a big event for the college kids, especially the seniors who were old enough to buy booze. Each year, we ran costume competitions, came up with spooky-themed cocktails, played horror movies on the bar's TVs. It was a whole big event. But since Halloween was on a Saturday, the local crowd was going to be mixing with the college crowd and it would be one of the biggest Halloween parties the bar ever saw. Naturally, I'm pretty excited about this. So imagine my disappointment when, on the day itself, I get a call from my boss who had a huge favor to ask me. My boss and his partner owned a few different bars and restaurants and one was down in Fairmont, about 15 miles south of Morgantown. Somehow, they'd come up incredibly short staff that Saturday and my boss asked me to drive down there to work the evening shift as their bartender. I could have just said no, and he did just ask someone else to do it, but I knew that him owing me a favor like that would put me in a very, very good situation when it came to getting off time around Christmas. So, I said yes. I picked up the smartest shirt and slacks combo I could find, given that the place was way more upmarket than the bar I worked at, and then I drove down to Fairmont around 3.30pm to set their bar up. I decided it wouldn't be so bad because since the place closed at like 11pm and the kitchen staff said everyone was usually on their way out by 11.40, I figured I could just drive back home then walk around to the bar to catch the last few hours of Halloween as a civilian. You know the deal. The shift at the restaurant dragged, but when it was finally over, I hopped back in my car and set off for Morgantown. Now what I should have done was take the 79 back, same way I've gotten down there before, but once I was in Fairmont, getting onto the 79 would have meant going back on myself, so I figured it'd be quicker to get onto the 19 and head back on a different route. That probably means nothing to people who don't know the area, so let's just say that I took a shortcut. The shortcut proved a big mistake in terms of route choice. The roads were much more winding and considerably less well lit, so... Anytime I made up and not doubling back on myself was lost trying to drive as safely as I could. I made it about 80-90% to 90 back to Morgantown, still driving super carefully, and I'm literally just considering what a dangerous stretch of road I'm on when this other car comes into my headlights. It's off the road, on a patch of grass, not moving, and the passenger door is open. Reaching into the passenger door is a guy who briefly shoots me this look as I drive past him, one that makes me think that he might have needed help. I could have just kept driving, pretending that I didn't see anything and made it back to Morgantown with time to spare, but part of me knew that I'd feel like a total douche the next day, just leaving someone stranded at the side of the road when all I could think about was myself. So I slowed down, pulled a U-turn, and drove back to see if the guy needed any help. I'm not going to lie. It did occur to me that going back might have been a bad idea. It was Halloween after all, creepiest night of the year, but I figured if I pulled up and the guy looked like an axe murderer, I could just reverse the heck out of there and speed off before they turned my skin into a mask or something. I knew that the person was wearing a white short sleeve shirt of some kind, so I cut my eye out for it as the car came into my headlights again. But as I pulled up, they were nowhere to be seen. There was someone in the passenger seat though, so I kept a bit of a distance, opened up my car door, leaned out, then called over to her to see if she was okay. She didn't reply. She kept staring off into the near distance like she couldn't hear me. She looked okay, so I got out of my car to walk over to her, but with each step I took towards the car, I realized more and more that something wasn't right about the woman I was looking at. It was a look in her eye this glassy, half-awake look, and before I even got over to open the door, I realized that she might not even be conscious. If I'd have parked my car up at another angle, I'd have seen it way before I got close to her, but it took me until I was within touching distance of the car to realize that she was dead. Someone had stabbed her over and over again in the stomach, groin, and thighs. Her t-shirt was a dark color that didn't really show it, but her jeans were just completely drenched. 
I couldn't quite believe what I was looking at for a second. I mean, there was just so much blood, so much it was dripping off the seat and onto the floor of the car. I don't know if that's where she died or if someone had posed her in the seat like that, but I remember how frighteningly peaceful she looked. Not peaceful like content, peaceful like she'd just chosen to give up at some point. I remember actually being frozen for what felt like a good few seconds, but that could be my mind just pumping with adrenaline, making it feel like it was longer than it was, because it sure did feel like I'd been standing there for too long when another thought occurred to me. Where was the guy that I saw in the white shirt? I can still remember how the question made my flesh creep, and I'm not just saying that as a means of conveying how scared I was, I could actually feel it. It was like I could actually feel the terror running through me, and as I turned back to my car, I prayed that I wouldn't see him standing near it, blocking the route to my escape. I couldn't see it, but you gotta remember that I'd left my car running with the headlights on, and you better believe that I was looking at those dark patches around the lights thinking he could be right there, and I'd never know it. Just looking over my shoulder made me feel incredibly exposed and vulnerable, so I turned back towards the car only to see something that made me jump out of my skin. There was a tree line maybe only 10 to 15 feet away from the car, and even with my night vision ruined by the glare of the headlights, I saw something pale shift among the tree trunks. It was the white shirt. It had to be. He was watching me from the darkness. I'm still not 100% certain that that was the case, but I didn't stick around to find out. If my worst suspicions were true, and the guy had stabbed that poor girl to death, there was no telling what he'd do to me in the name of eliminating a witness. I just ran back to my car and put my escape plan into action, feeling a deep sense of relief when I finally put the pedal to the metal. And needless to say, I didn't end up going out that night. I just drove back to my apartment, called the cops, and spent the next few hours either on the phone with dispatch, waiting for the cops to arrive at my place, then telling them what I'd seen when they finally arrived. I told them what kind of car I thought it was, what the woman looked like, the exact stretch of road that I was on at the time, and when they're done taking notes they relay everything I'd said to their higher ups. And from what I can gather, the goal was to get another patrol car to head out of town to find where I was talking about, but since it was a Halloween weekend, the department didn't have anyone to spare. That's when they asked me if I minded taking a ride with them to show them the exact location where the car was. If I had gone off-road, there was a chance that it had left tire tracks, and if they really were dealing with a murderer, then the kinds of tires used on the car could end up being the difference between a conviction and an acquittal. And that's why they needed my help. They weren't so much looking for the car, which they figured would be gone already since I'd stumbled across the scene. They needed the exact spot it had been stopped at so they could potentially take an impression of the tires. Once that was explained to me, I had no problem giving up my time. If my testimony was going to be the difference in catching a guy and having a killer on the loose, the choice was an obvious one. So I followed the cops downstairs and climbed into the backseat of their cruiser. They were right about the car not being there, but I did manage to retrace my steps, so to speak, until I was looking at the exact patch of grass and trees where the car had been. After that, we had to wait a while until another unit showed up to secure the scene, but eventually, I got a ride back to my apartment, even if it was way after all the bars closed, and let me tell you, I've never needed a drink so much in my entire life. Thankfully, my coworkers and boss were still at the bar I worked at, hanging out after closing time and enjoying a few drinks of their own. I stopped by, they let me in, and boy did I have a scary Halloween story for them that night. I managed to get a few sympathy beers out of it and they did a great job of taking the edge off, but going back to my apartment on my own was a different story. I didn't have any nightmares about finding that woman, but it definitely played on my mind for a long time afterwards. The cops only called me once to confirm a few details about the car and the guy I'd seen, but following that, I didn't hear a thing about it aside from a few pieces on the local news. I still think about it though. All this time later, especially around October and November each year. I wonder if the cops ever caught the guy. If he actually killed the girl or was just trying to get her to the hospital after someone else attacked her. Sometimes I think I really do see a ghost every Halloween. 
just not in the sense people might expect. I'm not haunted by some translucent spirit floating around dark corridors. Instead, I'm haunted by that look on the woman's face. The one that looked almost like she'd given up on life. The one that made her look like death didn't scare her anymore. This happened when I was 11 years old. I was trick-or-treating with two of my friends, who I will call Tom and Jerry. It was towards the end of the night, and most of the trick-or-treaters had already gone home. We decided to hit one more house before calling it a night. The house that we stopped at looked like it had been abandoned for years, but there was a lit jack-o'-lantern on the front steps. So against our better judgment, we decided to proceed. There were a bunch of scratch marks all over the front door. But before we could knock, we heard a loud scream coming from inside the house. It didn't sound like a distorted scream from a Halloween decoration. It sounded like a genuine scream of terror. The door then slowly creaked open. and a decrepit hand emerged from the darkness, reaching out for us. We then heard what sounded like a witch's laugh. <laughs> My friends and I fled from the house, hearing footsteps running behind us, and a haunting voice calling out, Come and get your candy, my children. We ran all the way back to Tom's house, we had no idea if we were still being followed. Jerry and I decided to stay the night because we didn't want to risk going back out again. <laughs> I woke up at around 2 a.m. and I heard that same laughter. I looked over and I saw something smeared across the bedroom window. I woke up Tom and he looked. Um, it looks like an egg. Thinking that someone was egging his house, me and him went downstairs and immediately noticed that one of the windows that faced the street was broken. Tom's parents weren't home at the time. Jerry then came rushing down the stairs. What's happening, guys? I heard someone laughing outside. From outside the door, we then heard someone say, you forgot your candy, my children. We all then rushed to the nearest window and saw a deranged-looking woman grabbing a pumpkin from Tom's front porch and then hurling it at the door. The insane woman started screaming like a mental patient. Ah! As she ran to the front door and started banging and kicking on it, we fled the house through the back door and made our way to my house, which was only down the block. We woke up my dad, and after telling him what was going on, he called the cops. The police arrived a short time later, but they did not find the crazy woman. The day after all this happened, November 1st, Tom called me. Hey, man, that crazy lady left some candy on the back porch and there was a note that said I should eat it. My parents took it to the police station, and they found a bunch of thumbtacks in all the candies. I also overheard the cops talking to my parents, and I heard something about finding dead bodies in that old, creepy house we were at last night. The next Halloween, we saw that same house being torn down. Apparently in the basement of the house, they found a bunch of knives, ropes, and tapes. That crazy woman wasn't found until two years later. Apparently, she had been living in the woods behind that house. To everyone out there listening, please be safe this Halloween. And always, check your candy. This happened a few years ago on Halloween. I'm 28 years old. And most people in my friend group get together for a Halloween party the weekend of Halloween. On this year, Halloween was on a weeknight, so our party was later in the week. 
That meant I didn't have anything going on on Halloween. I live in a smaller house and was just planning on hanging out and giving out candy to trick-or-treaters all night. By the time it got to be about five o'clock, the first trick-or-treaters arrived. I would say my neighborhood is pretty average. I don't get a crazy number of people, but a steady amount throughout the night. As time went on, the sun set a little after six o'clock or so. It was around this time when I was in my living room and heard a knock on the front door. It was a strong and powerful knock. Most people rang the doorbell, so I really noticed this. I was a little bit slow to get up and get to the door, and by the time I did, nobody was there. I felt bad because some kid must have missed out on getting candy from me, and I meant to answer the door a little bit sooner. I looked around to see if I could see anybody walking down the street, but I didn't. After that, I went back inside. I got a few more kids at the door over the next hour or so. Once again, there was another loud knock on the door after that. I was much quicker to answer the door, but again, nobody was there. Now I was beginning to think that I was being pranked or something. When it got later in the night, it happened yet again. It was the only time people knocked on the door too. Everybody else would just ring the doorbell, so I knew when I heard the knock, whoever had done it would be gone by the time I answered. The last trick-or-treaters came by at about 8.45 or so, and by 9 o'clock, things were really quiet. At that point, I turned my lights off, signaling that I wouldn't want any more trick-or-treaters. It was about 9.30 when I heard the knocking yet again. I ran to the door and opened it as fast as I could. Still, nobody was there. I was pretty annoyed by this now. Who would have time to repeatedly knock on my door over the span of three or four hours just to run away before I could answer? I left my house and took a couple of steps out into my yard looking all around. I didn't see anybody. I called out asking who was there, but of course got no response. I shook my head and started walking back into my house. When I reached my front step, I suddenly heard a noise in the bushes directly in front of my house and to my right. When I looked, I was just in time to see somebody emerge from the bush and was headed straight for me. This person was a grown man and I had never seen him before. I had maybe 10 feet between him and the front door. I ran as fast as I could, pretty much just as a reaction. When I reached the door, I swung it back open and got inside. I closed the door right behind me and it closed right on the man's arm who was trying to get inside after me. This was just my screen door, so it didn't hurt him too bad, but it was enough to cause him to remove his arm from the door and back outside. This gave me enough time to slam the larger door and lock it, right before he opened the screen door and tried coming into my house. I screamed that I was calling the police, and then got my phone out of my pocket to do so. I looked out the window, and I watched the man running away through my yard and then down the street, but I called the police anyways. When they arrived, I told them all I could, and this was thankfully enough to keep the man away, because I never saw him again. When I was in college, Halloween was always a big time for parties and such. During my junior year, I shared a house with a couple of my roommates who were some girls I had met and become good friends with during my freshman year. All of us had a bunch of our friends over to our place for a Halloween party, which was a total of about 20 or 30 people. Our house was small, but we did have two floors, but it was basically a typical old house you would find in a college neighborhood. Our university was pretty big, so I'm sure there were a bunch of other parties going on that night as well. We all wore costumes, and I recognized most of the people even though they were wearing disguises. At about 10 p.m., most of us wanted to go out to the local bars in the college town. We all started to leave, but there was this one guy who I had no idea who he was. He was dressed as the Joker from Batman, but he had on a mask instead of painting his face, so I couldn't recognize him at all. I went over and asked him who he was, but he didn't answer me. He just kind of looked at me and then sort of walked away. There was music playing and other people talking, so maybe he didn't hear me is what I thought. Eventually, I went upstairs to get my wallet and keys, and when I came down, most of the people were gone, aside from my roommates and I, who were all set to leave. We left the house and locked up. Then we were able to walk to the bars because they were only a few blocks away. I was out for maybe two or three hours. I remember I think it was a Thursday, and I had class the next morning, so I decided to go back a little after midnight. I didn't want to be out too late, and my roommate Liz and I walked back together. Our other roommates said they would come back later. When we got back, I unlocked the door and went inside first. As soon as I did, I heard a noise from inside. I realized quickly that it was coming from the inside of the closet we had just in front of the stairs. I walked over and opened the door. When I did, I saw the guy who was dressed as a joker, but his mask wasn't on now. I could clearly see that he was an older looking guy, like in his 50s, and I had no idea who he was. 
before any of us had a chance to do anything. I slammed the door back and immediately ran away. Liz saw me running and we both went outside. I called the police and we began walking right down the street in the direction we had came from. We later went back when the police were there. We were told that the man was now gone. Our entire house was searched, but they couldn't find him. I guess he had been able to get away. I'm not sure how he knew to go into our house, but apparently he had hidden in the closet while we were leaving. It's really creepy that he was hiding in our house alone the whole time we were gone. We must have caught him off guard when we got back and he went to quickly hide in the closet. I'm glad I heard him or else who knows what would have happened. This story happened many years ago when I was a kid. I think I was 11 years old. I remember that for Halloween every year, I would usually go trick-or-treating with some friends and then we would hang out afterwards. On this year, I was planning to trick-or-treat with my friend Tyler and then he was going to come over and hang out at my house afterwards. My house was sort of big and we had a cool basement with a big TV for playing video games or watching movies. We also talked to our friend Alex at school earlier in the day and he was planning on coming over that night, but he had to go trick-or-treating with his sister so he wasn't going with us. When the night arrived, Tyler and I went all around our neighborhood and beyond it to the surrounding neighborhoods. We were out until about 9 and we got tons of candy. Then we walked back to my house where my parents were. Tyler and I went down into the basement and played some video games while we waited for Alex to get there. This was before the days where every kid had a cell phone, so we didn't know exactly when he would be there. We left the back door to the basement unlocked for him to come through though. My parents were watching a movie upstairs, and we were down in the basement for about 20 minutes or so, when we heard the back door open and shut. It was around the corner from the room we were in, and we assumed that it was Alex arriving. I called out to where we were and told him to join us. However, I didn't hear Alex respond. I got up and walked out to the hallway near the back door. Nobody was there. It was weird because I was so sure that I had heard the door open and shut. I went back and asked Tyler if he had heard the door, and he told me yes, he heard the exact same thing that I had. I looked all around the basement once more, but nobody was there. I thought maybe Alex had opened the door, but then decided to go around to the front or something, and I went back to playing video games with Tyler. Only five minutes or so after this, I thought I heard somebody walking around in the hallway, and then I heard another door open and shut. The basement living room area where we were was completely out of vision of the back door and hallway with some guest bedrooms in it. It sounded like one of the bedroom doors had shut. I got up and walked over, and when I did, I saw one of the doors was in fact shut. I couldn't quite remember exactly if it had been open or closed before, but I was pretty sure it was open. I was sort of creeped out now and went back to tell Tyler about it. Just then, I heard the back door open and shut again. Then I heard Alex's voice. I walked out and saw him standing in the doorway. He asked me what was wrong when he saw the look on my face. I didn't say anything until all three of us were in the living room together and then we told him all about what had happened. I decided I would go up and find my parents and tell them about everything, but before I did, we once again heard the back door open and then close. I walked out and saw the bedroom door that had been shut was now wide open. I ran to the back door and locked it quickly and then ran upstairs and found my parents. My dad came downstairs and looked around, then he went outside. After doing so, he came back in and said he couldn't see anything that looked out of sorts. I never saw who was in the house that night, but it creeps me out to think about it every time. Back when I was still a junior in high school, me and my cousin used to volunteer with the local church and every Halloween, we'd act as chaperones for the younger kids so they could trick or treat in safety. It was a pretty good gig if I'm honest. Most people whose homes you stop at recognize you were the chaperone and offer you a piece of candy or two which meant you could still cop some free candy despite being way too old and out of costume. We'd been chaperones during our sophomore year so we knew how much free candy you could get and since we didn't have anything better to do on the next year's Halloween, me and my cousin figured we'd volunteer again. Just like the first year, we took charge of about four third graders each, then walked them around the neighborhood, knocking at any houses that had decorations outside. We head up this one cul-de-sac, and we start working our way around the circle of houses when I notice an older kid sitting on the porch of a house across from us. 
He was maybe about 12 or 13, older than the kids we had with us, but definitely younger than we were, and he's just mad-dogging us from across the street. He did not look happy to see us there at all, and I even gave my cousin a nudge to be like, what's that kid's problem? We agreed to maybe not knock at that kid's house on the way out of the cul-de-sac, as we definitely didn't want some sort of confrontation occurring, but in the meantime, we could still knock at other homes so the kids could get some candy. My group had just finished up at one home and was in the process of leapfrogging my cousin's group when I heard a snapping sound coming from the other side of the street. Having not recognized what the sound was, I had no urgency about me as I turned to see where it was coming from, but when I did, I could feel the blood draining from my face. The angry looking kid from the other side of the street was in the middle of reloading one of those brake barrel air guns and I started to panic as I realized that he might have hit one of the kids in my group. And that's when the scream started. My head whips around to see a little girl who's in the middle of unleashing the most ear splitting scream I'd ever heard. She's pointing at another kid, one dressed as the blonde girl from that Frozen movie who had a hand over her eyes with blood dripping out from underneath it. I remember going to complete panic mode, not so much because of the kids were hurt or even that her injury seemed like it was really bad, it was because I'd already seen the kid reloading. He didn't just shoot and run away, he wanted to keep shooting. My first thought was to tell the kids to run for cover but before I could even get a word out, they were scattering in different directions. Meanwhile, my cousin had been wise enough to the kid shooting pellets at us from the moments he fired the first shot and the kid only barely got another pellet into the barrel before my cousin just slammed into him. Both of them were sprawled out on the ground for a second, then just before I ran away to help, my cousin wrenches the air gun away from the kid and starts beating the life out of him. I mean absolutely knocking the snot out of this kid over and over again. What came next was just total chaos. People were coming out of their houses, drawn by the sound of the screams. Most didn't seem to know what was going on and even tried to get my cousin off the shooter before he started yelling back at him about how he was the one who'd stopped the shooting. The cops took way too long to show up because there was no initial reports of gunshots or anything. That and I guess they were super busy with it being Halloween. The EMT showed up first and it was while the little frozen girl was being treated that I learned her injuries weren't that bad. I thought the little pellet the kid had fired had taken the poor thing's eye out. It turns out, it had struck her just around her eyebrow and although there was a nasty gash, she hadn't been blinded, thank god. Once the injured girl had been taken off to the hospital and I had made about a dozen phone calls to a dozen different people, I finally led the kids back to our church, leaving my cousin to wait for the cops while still sitting on the shooter. My cousin said the whole time his biggest worry was the shooter's kid's parents appearing, but he was in that cul-de-sac for just over an hour and not only did they not show up, but no one seemed to know who or where they were. He told me that after the cops arrived, they arrested the kid, asked him a few questions, and he passed on my cell number so they could talk to me too. I didn't realize it until talking to them, but I don't think I'd taken the time to properly process what had happened. So as I was breaking down what I'd seen before the kid fired, I ended up breaking down too. Like I said... The shooter was only maybe 12 or 13 years old, meaning he probably is either in juvie or some kind of program as I'm writing this. I know kids his age can be mindlessly and thoughtlessly cruel, and that in opening fire on that little frozen girl, he hadn't properly thought through his actions. But I remember being that age, and I can't imagine having the hatred or malice in me to do anything like shoot an air gun at a little girl's head. It's no surprise to me that his parents weren't around and I'm not trying to excuse his actions, but I've always wondered what the kid's home life was like for him to even think about hurting someone like that. I hope he was punished, don't get me wrong, but at the same time, I hope that kid gets the help he needs. Not so much because I feel particularly bad for him, which to be fair I do, it's because if he doesn't get help, that little girl might not only be the innocent young female, he ends up hurting. 